my name is Pedro Roganchi. Uh, I'm an assistant professor of mining engineering at New Mexico Tech Institute of Mining and Technology. Uh, I'm chairing the session with the help of Dr. Amini, a uh, postdoc flow from Virginia Tech. This is industrial mineral and aggregate health and safety in industrial mineral and aggregate operation. It's co-sponsored co by uh, health and safety division. This is the first year experience and it turned out to be very successful. We had 10 or 11 uh, abstracts and we had to choose five, eight, eight from them. So we have eight presentation. I gonna ask all the presenter, please be on time. Uh, we have a timer here. I'm gonna start it for you. I was talking to um, a few hygienists last week about heat exposure and I said heat exposure is a safety hazard. And uh, in mining, we don't address it as safety hazard. And he said in most of the industries, they don't address heat exposure as a safety hazard. As far as they don't see the sign of heat exhaustion, they are okay. But Jacob mentioned that it's a safety hazard. Um, our next presenter is Ms. Elohe Talebi. Elohe is a graduate student um, at New Mexico Tech. Uh, she received her bachelor's degree in mining engineering uh, from Isfahan University of Technology in 2004. She worked as a consultant engineer and as a mining engineer for over 10 years. She also has the experience to work with the Iranian Mining Engineering Organization as a mine technical supervisor in Esfahan. She is currently working on her master's thesis and uh, her current research interests include mine health and safety and thermal management uh, in the mines. So Ella, please. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, thanks for coming to my presentation. First of all, I wanted to appreciate Dr. Roganchi, who is my advisor during my master program. So here is uh, my presentation about assessment and modeling of heat-related accident in the U.S. mine operations, which is the collaboration with Dr. Tarshizi from National University of San Diego. So why heat is uh, important for us? Heat exposure can have uh, severe effects on the health of the workers. So when we talk about health, we know the heat-related illnesses such as heat rash, all the way going through the heat stroke, which can have a permanent effect on the brains of the workers. Also, heat exposure can have a safety problem for the workers, such as fatigue, fainting, loss of concentration, and more importantly uh, for us as a miner, this application of personal protective equipment. All of these can cause uh, productivity reduction, uh, production delay, time losses, and also accident and injuries. When we talk about accident and injuries, we got this data from uh, US Department of Labor, which shows us that we have, uh, sorry, 189 of uh, fatal injuries during the 2011 to 2016 in all industries in US. Among them, natural resources and mining industry have 27 fatal injuries. Above that, we have uh, data for non-fatal injuries uh, in this duration, which is above uh, 16,000 of uh, accidents. If you look at the mining industry specifically, uh, data from MSHA shows us that we have uh, so many heat-related accidents 
during 2000 to 2017 in uh, U.S. mines. Those data, uh, the details of those data shows us that we have the higher, uh, highest rate of the accident in open pit mines, mill operation and pre preparation plan. Uh, but also underground mines have over than 6% of total accident, which is going to increase because of the high demand of the metal uh, and underground mines are going to be deeper. Here we can see uh, over than 87% of the accidents are happen in the metal, non-metal mines compared to the coal mines, which have just 13% of total accident. In this table, you can see the uh, accidents in different mining sections. So uh, if we look at the details of those data, we, uh, we see the number of heat-related accidents versus season. So we have the highest rate of the accident in summertime, over than 74% of total accident. It is obvious that it's due to the high, env high environmental condition uh, and in the summertime. So how we can reduce the number of the accidents? We think that uh, providing the, designing the proper ventilation and cooling strategy for underground mines can be helpful. And on the other hand, for the surface mines, we can use the shades and also personal protective equipment, uh, such as cooling garments can be helpful to reduce this number of accidents. Uh, proper closing and work rest cycle uh, will be helpful as well. So here you can see the number of accidents versus time of the accidents. So we have uh, 245 uh, over than 41% of total accidents that happen from 12 to 4 p.m. We know that the uh, day shifts are more susceptible to the accidents. How we can reduce uh, these numbers, numbers, number of accidents? We have, we recommend these prevent, prevention methods. Uh, maybe we can reschedule heavy tasks to night shift and uh, all, again, providing the shade uh, for surface mining and uh, management should uh, provide the proper clothing for the workers and individuals who are exposed to heat and hydration plan, which means that uh, they can provide the cold water inside the site for the workers uh, when is necessary. So here uh, we can see the number of the heat-related accident versus lost days from work. It shows us that over 42% of total accidents have uh, lost dates, which means we have uh, production delay, uh, time loss, uh, productivity reduction, which, are, which is not good for mining industry and the rate of the injuries will uh, increase. How we can decrease uh, this number? Training and education is very important. We have to train workers uh, about the consequences of heat exposure and how they can prevent to uh, have the heat-related illnesses. Signs can be helpful, so we can put the signs throughout the mines to remember our workers, uh, what can they do when they have a problem? When, for example, when they feel fatigue or fainting, how they can stop uh, to have more problem? And medical monitoring also, it would be helpful. 
If you look at the number of the accident uh, versus uh, years of the experience, we have these uh, many accidents that shows the workers with less than five years of ex experience are more vulnerable to have the accidents. We think that uh, new workers and less experienced workers, uh, they are not uh, alert to the hazard and they are more motivated to get the promotion and maybe they are afraid of uh, losing the job. That's why uh, they, they have more accidents. So what can we do? We can train them, we can educate them. And the employer and management should support them, should communicate with them. And also acclimation plan, which means that the, we can have the, some special program for acclimating the workers. Uh, NIOSH have a different acclimation plan for new workers and experienced workers. We can use that for decreasing this problem. So here we uh, correlate the number of the accidents and years of the experience. Uh, it shows that uh, they have relatively uh, close correlation, which means that when the years of the experience of the worker is increasing, the number of the accident is decreasing. Again, in this table, we can see the same result. Uh, when the years of the experience of the worker is uh, decreasing, the number of the accidents is increasing, and also we have more accidents in night sh uh, day shifts. So for conclusion, uh, those data shows us that the mining industry has cons uh, considerable rate of heat-related accidents. And uh, also the surface mining have more accidents, but underground minings are going to uh, have more accidents in the future. We have higher rate of accident in metal, non-metal mine compared to coal mines. And the times that is uh, more uh, we have more problem, it's 12 to 4 p.m. And summertime, uh, we have more uh, higher rate of the accidents. And uh, so we can, we know that the consequences of heat is losing the uh, work day. So we have productivity uh, reduction and time loss and production delay for the mine. And the result shows us that less experienced workers are more vulnerable to heat stress. So we try to uh, give the recommendation and a controlling method based on those data that we got. First uh, controlling method, which is the uh, less effective method is the engineering control. So engineers uh, have a role to uh, design the good ventilation and refrigeration system, and uh, they should uh, select the appropriate heat stress indices. Second uh, controlling program is the management control. So management should provide the proper personal protective equipment. They should have the regular monitoring Acclimation plan, hydration, and training plan is very important. Uh, and for training, we can use the signs and posters uh, for educating the workers. Next uh, controlling method is the individual controlling method, uh, which is uh, the most effective controlling method. So uh, if we train the workers, uh, they can uh, have the self-paced working and they can pay attention to the personal care. They can have the communication with coworkers and management when the problem is happening. And the last one is the administration control. Uh, 
they have the role for providing the education and they should provide uh, the report and modif uh, modifications. Thank you for attention. If there is any question, I can answer. So is there any question for Elohe? Uh, actually, I'm not sure about this because we have uh, this data from uh, MSHA. Uh, I don't know the number of the coal mines compared to metal and non-metal mines, but I guess that the number of the metal and non-metal mines are more, so we have more uh, workers, we have more problem. It's just my suggestion. I I'm not sure about the numbers. Uh, one reason would be that most of the surface mines that we have are in the area of Arizona, New Mexico, and Nevada, and we don't have that many coal mines in those areas. So those, those places get very hot. I also have a question. Uh, how, how do you think these data are accurate? Uh, how do you find out that these data that is provided to you is accurate? I'm not sure about the, that. I just got from MSHA. They uh, they divided a different accident that happened in mining industry, and they categorized this accident to heat exposure. So we are not sure. Sometimes we can see between those data that some of them just is the contacting with hot object, not the heat from the like environment and these kind of problems, heat-related illnesses. So I'm not sure about that, but it's just the data that we got. We don't have any other precise um, sources for our research. You mean the job that they have? The, or yes. Yes, they, uh, for each of these data, they have description that what was happened, you know, it's like a report that, uh, for example, uh, somebody just uh, faint, fainted at something happened to that. They just mentioned in the description, but some of them doesn't have any description, and we don't know what happened. Uh, if we can find a good resource of the data, yes. All right. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, hi, I'm Paige Goosey. Uh, like you said, I'm a master's student working under Dr. Emily Sarver at Virginia Tech. Uh, I'm in the DPM research group there, who Joe Tabor, the first presenter in this session, is also in. While he was looking at scavenging DPM, I'm looking more at the composition of DPM. Specifically today, I'm going to look at uh, gas phase organic carbon and how it interacts and affects our measurements and then go over uh, a study of if the sampling materials themselves contribute any gas phase organic carbon. So first off, this is a NIOSH funded project. So thank you for letting us do this research. And I wanted to thank Jim Knoll and Emmanuel Cotta at NIOSH for all of their knowledge on the 5040 and helping me throughout this process and allowing me to use their facilities and analyzers. Uh, same Josh Dixon and Sunset Laboratories has allowed me to go down there to their laboratory in North Carolina and run my samples there as well. So what is DPM and why do we care? So diesel particulate matter is the solid portion of diesel exhaust. It's uh, ty tiny carbon particles uh, in the submicron size range. Because they're so small, they can actually uh, get past a lot of our respiratory defenses and end up depositing deep into our lungs, causing uh, 
damage there and they can also translocate into other parts of our bodies, causing chronic and acute illnesses. Um, so pretty much everybody is exposed to DPM in ambient conditions from trucks on the roadways, but it's not high enough concentrations for us to see any health effects. The problem comes in occupations where we have high concentrations and long time exposure and underground mining is a perfect example of a high concentration in confined area where they're exposed for long periods of time. For that reason, we have exposure limits and for not metal non-metal mines right now, it's uh, 160 micrograms of total carbon for a cubic meter of air over an eight hour shift. So we use total carbon as the surrogate when we measure DPM and that is the sum of elemental carbon and organic carbon. So elemental carbon is the larger particles and you would commonly refer to it as soot. It's the black stuff. Uh, it's only a solid phase, which is really nice when we're de measuring DPM because we only want the particles. We only want the solid por por part. Um, so there's also the organic carbon and unlike EC, OC exists in a gas and a solid. Uh, the, oh, the gas phase can actually absorb onto our filters and onto the samples themselves, and that can cause some error in our calculations. So we don't want the gas, we just want the solids. To correct for this, we tend to uh, stack two quartz filters right on top of each other. The first top filter, the primary filter, is going to collect everything. That's the EC, the solid OC, and the gas OC. The secondary filter, the bottom filter, is only going to collect the gas phase OC. When you just subtract the secondary filter from the primary filter, you get this correction where it removes the gas phase and you're left with only EC and the solid portion of OC. That is what we call our total carbon. Uh, so when we collect these samples, this is a typical diagram of the train. We start with size selection. It's a sub-micron uh, size range that we're interested in. So we tend to use cyclones and impactors, one or the other, or sometimes both together. And that will remove the larger particles that we don't want in our calculation. And that's for something like dust. We don't want that. So once it goes through that size selection process, it uh, deposits in a cassette. It's a plastic cassette with the two filters stacked and a support pad underneath because the quartz filters are very fragile. Uh, this is all drawn through with an air pump, and then once we have those filters, uh, samples collected, we take a small punch out of each and we run it through a thermal optical analyzer. Uh, the current method is the NIOSH 5040 method, and this is an example thermogram that the analyzer spits out. Uh, what's important here is that the first part of the analysis is in an inert helium atmosphere. That means that only the organic carbon is going to evolve, and that's what we're measuring in that first half. That's what I'm interested in my research because I'm looking at that gas phase OC. The second thing I want you to note is that this is basically just an oven that is running at different temperature stages, and that's that blue line labeled temperature. Uh, so your filter is going to get heated up and then held there at a specific temperature so that all of the organic carbon at that, that will evolve at that temperature is going to, you get a very defined peak and then it moves on to the next isotherm. Uh, that is the pink OC peak line is the representation of how much OC we have at each respective isotherm. So this is a typical example of a primary filter thermogram overlaid on top of a secondary filter thermogram. The primary filter is the pink line, and as you can see, it has much larger peaks, uh, especially the very first isotherm, than the secondary black filter line, or OC line. That's to be expected since uh, the primary filter has all of the components. It has the EC, it has the solid OC and the gas OC, whereas the secondary filter only has that gas OC. So we expect that to be a smaller peak. The primary filter simply has more stuff on it. But what if we have examples where our secondary filter line, the black line, actually has larger peaks than the primary filter line, the pink line? That doesn't seem to make any sense, seeing as the primary filter should have 
at least the same amount of organic carbon on it. Uh, so when we have something like that happen where our secondary filter is higher uh, mass than our primary filter, and we do this correction where we subtract the secondary filter from the primary filter, we end up with a negative mass for OC, and that's impossible. So this observation is what has led to my research. I started out with three different data sets. The first data set is uh, from NIOSH, and it's all blank samples. The second data set is from a field study from a previous grad student's work, and that was taken at an underground um, stone mine. And so we have DPM samples along with blank samples. The third data set is also from a previous grad student's work, and that's just lab-generated DPM samples. So the results of doing that data analysis, we've concluded that this problem of negative OC only shows up on blank samples. With the exception of one uh, DPM sample through this data, we mostly see it on this low mass blank samples. That's important because when you're taking uh, higher mass DPM samples, you may just overlook any interference and not even notice if something weird was going on. So since this is a problem of blank samples, the question ends up being, well, where is it coming from? And that's what led to a short uh, study on the sampling materials. So I have five different conditions that I looked at. I looked at generic styrene cassette, cassettes from SKC and Zephon, along with the cellulose support pads, which the filters sit right on top of, the SKC impactors, which is one of our size selectors, and then the SKC impactor cassette. Um, I basically made a bunch of blank samples and I let, stored them for various time uh, periods, ranging from 25 days to 65 days. And then I also put half of them in a freezer and half of them in a low temperature oven. So that way we could see if the environmental conditions at which you store these cassettes and samples will also have an effect on your generation of uh, gas phase OC. So the biggest and most obvious result that we saw and we expected this is that when you store samples at higher temperatures, you end up with higher OC masses. Uh, the red is your stored hot and then the blue is stored cool. So all of the red is higher than the blue. Um, this is to be expected because when you heat something up, things evolve off of it, especially volatiles such as gas phase organic carbon. The second most significant result was that the SKC impactors uh, were a significant source of organic carbon compared to any of the other criteria. Especially when stored hot, it, it results in much higher mass. But uh, an important note is that the impactors affected the primary and the secondary filter equally. When you compare that to the cellulose support pad, you'll see that while it also does contribute organic carbon, it affects the secondary filter much more than the primary filter. And you can see that with the uh, X's represent the secondary filter and the triangles are the primary filters. So the X's with the support pads are much higher than the uh, primary filter. Then the final result from that study, we found that when I reanalyzed some of the conditions after an additional 20 days stored, we saw some increase in the OC. And that's to be expected because the longer you let something sit, more volatiles can come off and absorb onto your filters. So when uh, we found out that the sampling materials do contribute volatile OC to our filters, we decided that we need to understand how OC behaves. So the question of how volatile is this gas phase organic carbon? To answer that question, we looked at the thermal ramp. So the NIOSH 5040 standard method starts at initial isotherm at 250 degrees Celsius, uh, and it's a duration of 60 seconds. If something is more volatile, it's gonna evolve at a lower temperature. 
than something that's less volatile. So this gas phase organic carbon is gonna evolve at a lower temperature than the particulate phase organic carbon. So if we can play around with the first temperature and see when this gas phase will evolve, we can uh, maybe find that useful in separating the two. So that's what I did. I made two different thermal programs. Uh, one was set at 200 degrees Celsius and we extended it to 200 seconds for that initial isotherm. And the other one was set at 175 degrees Celsius, again, for 200 seconds. Extending that time frame was just to allow the full evolution of anything that's gonna come off in that temperature. We get a very defined peak that way. Um, so the results here, what I want you to see is that the OC coming from the SKC cassettes and the support pads did not evolve at lower temperatures, but the OC coming off of the impactor did at both the 200 degree temperature and the 175 degree temperature. That means that the uh, gas phase organic carbon coming from impactors is more volatile. So after finishing up this study, we found out that this problem of negative OC occurs on blank samples and low mass samples. Because of this, we may be overlooking it when we measure higher mass DPM samples. Uh, the sampling materials themselves can contribute organic carbon to your filters, and the storage conditions that you keep them in will also affect how much organic carbon you get off or contribute. Uh, so that means that we should probably take some care into how we're storing samples, how long we're storing them, and then also keep in mind that the support pad affected the secondary filter more than the primary filter. So that can cause some issues. Uh, the OC from some of the sampling materials, particularly the impactors, can evolve at lower temperatures. And so the idea that maybe we can manipulate the thermal program to remove volatiles from the process could be an interesting next step, which is my next step. Um, <laughs> so the idea that uh, if we can find a temperature that will maximize our volatile evolution while minimizing our particulate evolution, we could potentially get rid of this stacked filter setup and say that at this temperature, anything that came off before is volatile. We don't want it, throw it out. Anything that came off after that temperature, we could say is part of the measurement and that's good data. Uh, yeah. So to do this, I have two field studies plans. The first one is using a semi-continuous field analyzer, and I'm gonna use various temperatures to see how field-sourced organic carbon uh, varies at different temperatures. And then through that, maybe I can narrow down the temperature and find that golden temperature that's gonna solve all the problems. And eventually I can do the second field study where I'm com taking field samples and then comparing the standard 50-40 method to that new temperature. And we can do that through a modified thermal ramp like I have been doing, or we could also pre-bake them at that temperature so we can do a whole batch at once. Um, the idea is that once we get all this information, possibly we could compare a double filter correction to a thermal-based correction and see if error can be reduced in measuring DPM. Yeah, thank you. Uh, our next presenter is Dr. Jim Noll. Uh, Dr. Noll has a bachelor's in chemistry from Hale College and a PhD in analytical uh, chemistry from University of South Carolina. He has worked in the field of analytical and physical chemistry for over 20 years in both industry and government. He is currently a senior research chemist with the United States National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, NIOSH. He is 
he focuses his research on investigating uh, control technology and measurement techniques for reducing and assessing uh, miners' exposure to hazardous substances such as diesel particulate matter and silica dust. In addition, he has been involved in research in electromagnetic in interference on proximity detection systems, function of uh, proximity detection systems for mobile equipment and refuge, refuge uh, alternatives. Please. Well, thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, this afternoon, what I want to talk to you about is the effect that organic carbon on the filter media in SKC DPM cassettes have on measuring DPM cassettes in underground mines. Well, between Paige's presentation and mine, by the end of this day, you guys are all going to be experts on IOS 5040 and absorption of vapor phase. The uh, standard method for measuring DPM is to collect it onto a quartz fiber filter for an entire shift and then take this filter into the, uh, to the laboratory and take a punch of it and measure it using NIOS 5040. And as Paige said, there's two conditions. One is the helium-only atmosphere where the temperature's ramped up so you can measure the organic carbon coming off. Then the temperature's decreased, it's raised up again. And this time, though, in the helium-oxygen mixture, and this is where your elemental carbon com components will come off. And this way you have el organic carbon, elemental carbon, and the two together add up to total carbon. Uh, this is necessary because MSHA uses the surrogates of total carbon and elemental carbon to determine the, the exposures of miners to DPM. Now, um, total DPM measurement was not selective or uh, um, sensitive enough. So therefore, we had to use a surrogate. And at first, it was used as total carbon because 80% of DPM is total carbon. So the PAL, or the personal exposure limits, written for 160 micrograms per meter cubed total carbon. However, other aerosols in the mine, such as cigarette smoke and oil mist and uh, uh, these artifacts, they can interfere with this TC measurement. So in, but also, besides TC, they also measure the EC. So on the personal sample, an EC is measured, and then a Conversion factors determine every time that they sample and in the mine, and, and it's downstream of where the miner is being sampled. Now, practically, though, if we look at it, most mines have a, approximately 1.3 as their ratio. There's some mines that are a little bit different, but we've looked at a lot of mines with these ratios, and a lot of them are around that 1.3. So the EC that would correlate to the 160 is about 123 micrograms per meter cubed. Now, as uh, Paige also mentioned, what you have is a personal pump that collects through an SKC DPM cassette. Now, the SK DPM cassette is used because this is to avoid the dust, because total carbon and even some dust, even elemental carbon, can be interfered with. So in order to segregate the dust from the diesel, an SKC DPM cassette is used. The SKC DPM set contains an impactor that segregates the dust from the diesel, but also inside, you have a ring, a still ring. This still ring is used so you have uniform distribution of DPM across the filter. Then you have two carbon filters, and you have a cellulose backing pad. Now, why do you have two carbon filters? Well, this is for the, to correct for the absorption of vapor phase organics. If we look at this picture now, the black dots will be solid particles. The circles that are blue will be considered the vapor phase. The, primary filter of the quartz filter is very efficient in collecting the particulate, but it also will absorb some of the vapor phase. But it's not efficient in collecting the vapor phase, so you can't use it to measure vapor phase. And then the second filter, it won't be exposed to vapor, I mean to particulate, because all the particulates can be collected by the first filter. However, it will absorb some vapor phase organics. And if you have the right conditions, the primary filter and the secondary filter will absorb similar amounts of vapor phase organics. So you have total carbon uh, from the first filter, which has your particulate and your vapor phase, and you can subtract the total carbon on the second filter, which is just your vapor phase, so that you can get what we consider particle bond total carbon. 
Now, any time you have an analytical method like that, it's important to know the blanks. It's important to know what's in the, on the filter media before you even start sampling. So we looked into some uh, previous studies, and there was a couple studies that we looked at that what they did is they took the quartz fiber filters and they preheated it before they put into a standard three-piece cassette. Uh, one of them was preheated by 550 degrees Celsius. One of the average media blanks when they did that, it was 0.22 micrograms per centimeter squared. Another study that did it was about their average on the media blanks was 0.47 micrograms per centimeter squared total carbon. But we found a study that did looked at the blanks and for when they use SKC DPM cassettes. And in this case, they actually found the average to be 1.84 micrograms per centimeter squared, much higher than the other two studies when they pre-treated their filters. And they had a maximum on the blanks of 4.72 micrograms per centimeter squared. So this kind of set up a red flag. Uh, one is, is this typical? This was one study we saw with SKDPM cassettes. Is this typical for these cassettes to have high organic carbon on the filter medium? And the other thing is the variability we saw. 1.84 is the average, but 4.72 is a max. Do we have a high variability? Because if there's a high variability between blanks, this is going to affect the limit of detection and limit of quantification that we can achieve when using these cassettes for sampling for DPM. So we looked at several non-expired SKC DPM cassettes filters, and you can see we looked at three batches. Now, non-expired means it's less than a year old. Once it's a year old, it's considered ex expired, and you're not supposed to be using it anymore. So we looked at three, two of the one of the batches was six months old, two of the batches were nine months old. Uh, we look here, there's a total of 27 cassettes, but we did two filters per cassettes, so um, we have 54 total filters. Then we also did 16 media blanks for how we usually treat with the filters. And what we usually do is we pre-treat the filters, we put them in an oven, and we at least have them for two hours at 800 degrees Celsius. Uh, before we put them in a three-piece cassette to use them for when we uh, sample for DPM. So again, we want to monitor the media blanks, and we're looking at to calculate now the LOD from these. So if we look at the results, if we look at uh, the first table here on the top, that is the cassettes that we made at Pittsburgh that we pre-treated for at 800 degrees Celsius. We can see that the EC is pretty low. There's hardly any EC on these media blanks. You had a 0.01 microgram per centimeter squared. But the OC and hence the TC, we had about TC was 0.53 micrograms per centimeter squared. We did have some on there. It's a little higher than the other two studies we saw, but one of the studies was 0 0.47, 0 0.53, not that bad. However, the SKC DPM cassettes, we saw similar conditions to the Bosch, where we saw high organic and high total carbon uh, when using these SKC cassettes in the media. In fact, they, they were as high as uh, two, for total carbon 2.57 micrograms per centimeter squared as on average. Now again, if we look at the EC, the EC is low, 0 0.06 micrograms per centimeter squared. So there's still not much on the EC on these media blanks, uh, but there is some, you know, I don't know if it's called contamination, but something uh, high organics on these compared to other samplers. So how does that affect the LOD, LOQ? Well, if we look at here, if we look at the 16 cassettes uh, blanks that's made from Pittsburgh, that's again the top uh, table here, we can see that the LOQ for EC uh, was 0.62 micrograms per centimeter squared. That is approximately what you would expect when you use NIOS 5040. NIOS 5040 uh, the limit of quantification is one microgram per centimeter squared per filter media section. So uh, we can see here this 0.62 is right where we would expect it to be. The total carbon is a little higher. We had a little bit of variability in the, in the blanks compared to what you, know, you would have just when you don't consider that for 5040. And it was at two micrograms per centimeter squared. That is approximately about 20 micrograms per meter cube total carbon eight hour TWA. So it's still not too bad. The SKC, though, um, for the total carbon, it went higher. If we just look at the eight-hour time-weighted average, now we're at 69 instead of uh, 10, what we would expect. 
Elemental carbon, we're right where we would expect to be. We're at nine micrograms per meter cubed um, time weighted average. So we wanted to look further into this. So now, we, not only did we, we, we already sampled the non-expired, we looked at some expired cassettes. These are cassettes that were at the mine, and I mean at, the, at our lab, I'm sorry, at our lab and never been used. We had two years old and a six years old uh, cassettes. And we did this first to find out how much the amount of OC was collecting over time. Was this something that was originally on a filter when they packed it, or is this something that's collecting over time? And this will give us an idea of maybe where the source is. Do we have off-gassing of the cassette? Do we have the silica gel uh, off-gassing in the cassette? So let's look first at the non-expired. The y-axis is the total carbon that is on the filter, and the x-axis is just a random number. It doesn't really mean anything. We could see this is for six-month and two nine-month um, batches. The orange and the red were both nine month old, so the same age. And we can see, visually here, you can see that the red has a lot more and a higher number of to, uh, total carbon on the filter. In fact, if you do a simple t-test, you find that, that those two, uh, cis, those two uh, groups are not statistically the same. But if we look at the blue and the orange, the blue is six month, the orange is nine month old, we can see that visually, they look like they're in about the same range. If we do a simple t-test, there is no evidence that these are not statistically the same. So looking at these three, just these three from six to nine months, we're not seeing there's any addition of total carbon just from time. Now if we look at the expired ones, we add them to it. The expired ones would be the ones after, but less than 2018, the expired year. And we can see the total carbon, which is on the y-axis, when they're expired, we're seeing a lot higher values in the total carbon. So the expired, we are collecting over time once it reaches a certain time. So this is kind of telling us we kind of have two things getting involved here. We have probably the, what's on the contamination of the filter media when you pack the cassette, and then we have it after it gets expired after so long, we are getting some kind of organic carbon getting onto the cassette. Now, we mentioned before that we have two full quartz filters, and we can use the second filter as a dynamic blank, and we can uh, subtract that from the first filter. So what if, when that subtraction happens, will that correct for some of this variability in the OC data? Um, in other words, is the filters inside the cassette being uh, exposed to similar organic carbon vapors that they're similar and will correct itself and maybe there's just a difference in between cassettes. So let's look at a, this table here, I mean this chart here. The y-axis is a subtraction of the first filter from the second filter. The x-axis is the total carbon that's on the first filter. Now if we look at the x-axis and we can see the blue is uh, non-expired the orange is expired cassettes, that we could definitely see that the orange is higher uh, uh, TC than the, than the blue, or the expired cassettes have higher TC values than the non-expired. And we would see, expect that to be typical, but we could just see that there's is definitely a sign there. Now, if we look at the y-axis, though, and that is a subtraction from the two, we can see that actually that they look pretty much in the same range, whether expired or non-expired. In fact, if you do a simple t-test, again, there's no evidence of statistical difference between the two groups. So this is trying to show that, may, that when you use that subtraction, that what is being absorbed over time is being absorbed by both the first and the second filter in this case. But there still is something that's happening when they first pack these cassettes on the filter media. As you can see, there still is a difference. Most of them are within one microgram per centimeter squared. So if we look at this and determine the limit of detection or limit of quantification from this, we can see that even with these subtraction in the blank, which actually makes it better, because now instead of like 69 micrograms per meter cubed TWA, now we're down to 54 as our limit of quantification. So it does help it, but there still is higher than what we see from other cassettes. So if we 
what we can tell is that the EC number, numbers are similar to what you would expect for 5040. Basically, there's very little EC on these filter medias. However, when using the SKDPM cassette, you have to remember that you're going to have a higher LOQ. Uh, in this case, it's like 66 micrograms per meter cube TWA LOQ for OC, and that's about 69 for TC. So you're going to have a higher LOQ when you use these samples. We also finding out that the contamination is probably part of it is from when they first initially make the cassettes, which means that there may be methods to improve this. If we can do some uh, better type of um, pretreatment on the filters, and we're going to have to talk to SKC and kind of work with them on this and see if they're willing to uh, do some investigation on this, and maybe we'd be able to improve the LOQ and the LOD when using these SKC cassettes. Um, we also, if you're going to use it for your cells and you're going to go do research with it, uh, it may be advantageous to actually pretreat the filter and put them back into the cassettes yourself. Um, that's kind of what we've been starting to do from this since we've had this data. Again, anybody who has, uh, we're calling for innovators. If you have a recommendation for innovators, there's a website for that. And I thank you for your time. If any questions. Yeah, yeah, I do. I, what I think is happening, now this is just, we haven't got deep enough to definite say this, but uh, I think like she's getting what we see over time from the expired, where we're getting that vapor phase. And I think that's from the cassette itself. Now, I don't know if it's from off-gassing of the plastic in the cassette or the silica gel that's in that cassette. We might be getting some off-gassing. And that, I think, is in a vapor phase form because I also had the same thing with, with when it's expired, I saw the same when the second filter is the first filter. So I think that is a vapor phase that's coming off that's being absorbed by both filters the same. And I think that's probably what she's observing too. Any other questions? All right, thank you. And uh, our last, we have one more actually. Yeah. Our last uh, presentation is for Mr. Mr. Forrest Wright, but uh, <laughs> Dr. Sarver gonna present. I asked her, she said I introduced her students. Uh, so uh, Mr. Wright is a graduate researcher at the Virginia Tech pursuing a master's uh, in mining engineering. He received his bachelor also from mining engineering department at the VT in 2017. He has experience in mine operations and maintenance and hopes to work in a mine operation and mine safety in future. Please. Right. Thank you, Pedro. I'm Son. So I am not Forrest, but I am his advisor, Emily. Um, and he, he said in his bio that he hoped to work in mine operations and safety soon, and he is starting that um, as of today. So that's why he's not here. He recently took a job with Kiewit down in uh, Texas at a surface coal operation, and he's actually starting today. So I'll be presenting his research for him. Um, so this uh, presentation is intended to give kind of an overview of continuous DPM monitoring um, applications for engineering and underground mines. 
So I do want to acknowledge NIOSH um, for funding this work. This is being funded under our capacity building project, um, and we're, we're quite thankful for that. Um, it's been a, a great opportunity. Um, special thanks also to our study mine partner, who we won't name uh, by name, but um, they have been ever so gracious to have us out there over the past five years um, and really support a lot of our research. Um, and also to Sunset Laboratories and to McGee Scientific. So um, they've both, uh, both of those groups have provided uh, monitors on loan to us and, um, and have really been very supportive in helping us understand and, and use their data. So I don't have to tell you that diesel particulate matter is a problem in underground mines because it represents an occupational health hazard, um, and we won't talk much more about that. Um, I will note that in large opening mines, ventilation is particularly difficult, and so DPM can be particularly problematic in, in these mines where it's really hard to, to move air. Um, personal monitoring is required for met, uh, metal non-metal mines. And uh, DPM monitoring, uh, not to confuse anyone too much with the facts, um, but you know, DPM is, is this very complex and non-homogeneous non uh, mixture of things, and um, its major chemical components are elemental and organic carbon, as the previous two speakers have noted. Um, we use a thermal optical method when we talk about compliance sampling in order to measure, measure the EC and the OC, and we sum those th two things together to get total carbon. Um, it turns out that EC pretty well correlates um, with what we can call black carbon if we want to define it by an, just an optical measurement. And so it is often the case that for non-compliant sampling in the U.S. and, um, and also uh, for sampling in other parts of the world, they tend to use EC um, sometimes to do their, their DPM monitoring. So typical monitoring, as the previous speakers have said, is, is um, done by collecting filter samples and waiting for a laboratory to return results. And that's great if we can get high resolution data, although the last two speakers have now called that into question. Um, but, so, so, um, but, you know, a, a, another problem aside from that is that, you know, if we're doing this, somebody's waiting on results, right? So if I've been overexposed today, it'd be nice to know that now, not two weeks into the future. Um, also, if I want to do an engineering project and see how a new ventilation pattern, a new production schedule, something, you know, changing in, in my equipment. Um, I'd like to know right now, is that helping me or hurting me so that I can do something different? So continuous monitoring is something that we're really interested in, um, and we know that can support personal protection and engineering projects in a number of different ways. Um, the FLIR AirTech is uh, a handheld monitor that was um, developed and designed and, and sort of developed by uh, NIOSH and then uh, it has been made a commercially available uh, by FLIR now. Um, and that is an optical measurement. So it's really, it's, it's fundamentally measuring e uh, excuse me, BC, but it's being converted to EC using a calibration curve. Um, if we want to look at long-term um, sort of static area monitoring in, in a mine, which could be used more for um, engineering projects, right, we need to go to an autonomous monitor. Um, and so, you know, that would allow us to track things over time. So McGee Scientific offers this BC monitor that they call an ethylometer, um, and we've been using one of those for a couple of years now. We're using their model AE33, which is shown right over here. Um, NIOSH has also prototyped a similar instrument called the Air Watch, and we've done some testing with that as well. Um, this is, is pretty analogous to that FLIR handheld monitor um, in the way that it works, and we'll talk more about that in just a moment. And then um, Sunset, who makes the laboratory OCEC analyzer, um, also offers this field analyzer, which um, is, a, is a pretty neat little tool. And so we've been testing that for a little over a year in our study mine. So the ethylometer, how does that work? Like I said, it's an optical measurement. Um, so what it's doing is it's just collecting a filter sample continually, um, and it's measuring the laser absorbance through that fil or on that filter um, over time. So you can see right here, this is just sort of a, a theoretical um, uh, plot to show. I, I thought you were seeing what I'm seeing, but you're not. So that, that's not working. Um, so right here, this is just a theoretical uh, kind of plot to show that over time, the filter is getting blacker as we're depositing black carbon on it. Um, the voltage, the sen optical sensor voltage is decaying over time. And so from that, we can calculate laser absorption. And from that, we can use a calibration curve to understand mass of BC that's been deposited on the, the filter uh, and then mass of EC that's deposited on the filter by comparing to the, the traditional 50-40 measurement. So this particular monitor uses a one-minute data collection rate. 
Um, and it's autonomous because it can plug into the mine power or even a, a battery if you wanted to. Um, and it's got this self-advancing filter tape. So if anyone is old enough to remember uh, VHS cassette tape or, or cassette tape for you know audio, when those used to be fun, um, it, it basically is on this roll here. And, and every time uh, the, the monitor understands that, whoa, got too much black, black carbon on here, I, I can no longer um, get this kind of nice curve, um, it'll switch to a new spot on the filter tape so it can start all over again. So that can be really helpful, right? If we want to look at DPM response to any number of factors. So changes in equipment, right? We've got um, a new piece in the fleet. We've got more equipment, changes in our operations, our maintenance, our fuel, um, production schedules, right? So this is a, a nice little graphic to kind of show that. So this is from our study mine. Um, the red line is, is really their normal production schedule. And this has been collected up near a production phase. Um, and what's happening is that around um, uh, mid-afternoon, they're starting what's going to be their evening shift, and that's the, their production shift now. Um, but when it's a vacation time or a holiday, um, they basically take, uh, instead of doing two eight-hour shifts, they're going to have a 12-hour shift where they're kind of doing everything. And so you can see how the DPM really tracks along with that. Um, and just in being able to do kind of continuous monitoring, um, this particular mine has actually shifted um, their production schedule over the past couple of years. They used to um, produce on, on their day shift, um, which meant then that their hand scalers were coming in. Um, so folks that were not in enclosed cabs coming in and, and scaling when DPM was still high in the production area, but knowing that that's the case, what they did a couple of years ago was decide to switch and now they'll produce on their evening shift so that the hand scalers are, are getting to operate in this condition, which is much better. So ventilation on demand demonstration, um, this has been something that we've been sort of dreaming of and hoping for for a couple of years now. And, um, and Forrest is, is just about seeing it through um, to fruition. And, um, and Sarah, who's in the audience, is an undergraduate student who is helping us collect the last bit of data on that now that Forrest has, has moved on to a, um, a much higher paying position. Uh, so, um, so a little bit about this um, particular project. Our monitoring location, this is, is the best schematic I could offer you um, and not reveal too much. Um, so here's here's kind of a mining production face. Um, this is a large opening mine, so they've got you know somewhere on the order of about 40 by 40 foot openings. Um, we've got our AE33, that ethylometer, located in arrays here. And, um, and they used to have a small auxiliary fan here. I'll show you some data from that. And recently, they've replaced it with a much larger fan here. And the idea is that, that this fan will be running. They'll be blowing clean air at the face. Um, but this is the way that all the air has to kind of exhaust out of here. So this is a nice monitoring location for us because we can kind of see what's happening um, temporally. So our study conditions were to, to look under um, several, several different conditions. Um, so we're looking um, at data from when there was no fan operating um, and when there was the old fan, that small fan, kind of operating continuously around the clock. Um, then we've got data from when the new fan is operating continuously. Um, what we're, the phase we're in right now is the new fan operating on sort of a preset timer, come on at 2 p.m., go off at 2 a.m., something like that. Um, and then the last bit of data, which is going to be the really exciting part, is what we hope to be collecting in the next few weeks, which is that the new fan is going to be controlled by the, the ethylometer data. Um, and that'll be really exciting because that's really the, the feedback part and um, something that you know no one has really demonstrated with, with DPM monitoring before. So I think this is going to be really exciting. Um, so you know, of course, one of the things we want to look at is let's analyze, are we able to control DPM and get that in, into a, a zone that's safe and healthy? Um, and also then what are our power savings if, if we go to these more optimized conditions being for and then ultimately number five. So this is kind of our equipment, right? We've got the AE33 located right there. It is talking directly to a Raspberry Pi, um, which is collecting that data from it. Um, then it's wirelessly going to transmit that data over to, um, to another Raspberry Pi that's hooked up to the fan and will control the fan to basically come on or go off under certain conditions. So there's some, some data. Um, keep an eye on the y-axis. So there's some data, same monitoring location. Everything is going to be the same except what ventilation condition we're talking about. Um, so there's our um, BC concentration. Now, this is not EC concentration. It's BC. So if you divide that about in half, you'll get the EC in this mine. Um, 
But what you can see is these are just um, four different days where we had data. This is a Monday. We know that because the DPM starts slow. <laughs> um, all the other days um, are a, a Tuesday through a Friday. So they've been producing um, the days before and things have not completely cleared out. Um, and what you see is, is what we always see. There's a little bit of um, uh, activity um, early on in the morning shift or the, the day shift when things start to, to ramp up in the mine. Um, but when production starts, things, things really go up in that location. Um, compare that then to when the old fan, that was when the small fan was always on, so just running all the time. And if we just click back and forth, you can kind of see some differences. Yeah, the old fan being on all the time certainly helps, um, but things are still quite a, quite a bit more than what we would like to see. If we then go to the, the next condition where we've got the new fan always on, that looks really good. Um, so hopefully you don't need too much between those two, but um, it's very low and that's very good. So the mine is quite happy right now. And I would note that they're quite happy um, in seeing all of this data too. So it feels really good when you're asking people for something all the time. Like you could also hand them data and, and show that what they're doing is actually helping and, and, um, and they're quite pleased to see that of course as well. Um, so the exciting conditions, I wish I could, <laughs> could show you more data from those. These are actually old, you know, old data sets, part of the, the plots that I just showed you when the fan was always off and when the new fan is on, right? And so what our plan is, and, and this is in progress right now, is to collect data on this timer schedule where the, um, the fan will come on at 2 p.m. right as production um, shift starts, and it'll go off at 12 a.m. And so the goal there is going to be to see um, how well that then controls the, the diesel particulate in this area. And then the last part, which, which we have planned and hope to start in the next couple of weeks, um, is to, to do this then when we're actually getting that feedback from the AE33 um, and, and having the, the fan controlled that way. And the, the plan at this point um, is that we will, once the 30-minute uh, rolling average um, has been higher than 100 microgram per meter cubed, um, that is when the fan will, will kick on. Uh, at least that's the plan. So we're hoping that force uh, coding has, has paid off there. Um, and then once um, we have seen that, uh, you know, for, for at least 30 minutes, um, we've got the BC below about 60 microgram per meter cube, the fan will be um, turning off. Um, so we've set this up in order to satisfy the mind's um, desire that the fan is not just coming on and going off all the time. Um, that would not be good for them or, or their equipment, um, but such that we, we hope to see that the fan maybe only needs to go on or off a couple of times during the production shift. So, so we'll see what happens and then what Forrest will be looking at is, so how did that help them in terms of both the DPM and their power costs? Um, one other thing I thought I would um, throw in is just this field testing of the OCEC analyzer um, because I think it's a really interesting tool and since we've been able to test that, it's, it's Sunset's uh, monitor that we're testing now and they have graciously allowed us to just keep it underground for a year and a half now. Um, and yesterday when I saw them, they didn't ask for it back and so I didn't offer. Um, but they, um, it's, it's really a neat little piece of equipment and, and um, by using it, what we have found is that, wow, there's a lot of cool things we could do that we didn't realize um, we would be able to do with it. Um, and so, uh, you know, in some applications, it might be nice to have some more robust data. So if we're concerned about other sources of OC, if mines are concerned about things around, you know, their maintenance shop where they're they're testing all kinds of different things, you know, this could be a really cool little tool to use. Um, I, I'm not sure it might be uh, something that that would be needing to be put into a budget very early on, um, but it's, it's, a, it's a nice little um, instrument. Um, and so it's just an, a, a portable version of their lab analyzer. Um, and it's set up basically to, to run through that standard 5040 program. Um, it's a, it's a semi-continuous monitor in that what's actually happening here is it's collecting a filter sample, just like a traditional um, measurement um, for some pe set period of time. So right now we have it set to collect on a, a 30 minute sample. Um, and then it spends the next 15 to 20 minutes running the 5040 um, profile on it and, and um, getting that data. So we basically have it, excuse me, set to come on and, and basically sample on the hour. So we're getting kind of one data point per hour, um, but still that's much better than, you know, one data point and two weeks later, you know what it was. Um, so that's what we're up to. Um, so, so there's um, that uh, installed in the mine. Uh, it's got a denuder 
on it, which is basically taking out the um, the, or the volatile organic, um, or at least most of it. So that's good. And, and Paige is going to be using that, as she mentioned, in order to get some nice data underground and lots of data points where otherwise it would have taken, um, you know, six months. We'll maybe do it in a month. Um, so that's really cool. Uh, and what we're looking at right now is trying to compare these three standard methods that are used um, to do organic and elemental carbon. So 5040 is, of course, used in, in high um, EC environments um, and for things like diesel particulate. Um, but the improved method and the USAR method are used pretty commonly more in ambient monitoring. Um, and, and so um, there are differences there. This is just to illustrate kind of there are differences there in the thermal ramping profile. And so you should expect differences maybe in how much OC they read. One thing I would um, point your attention to, uh, I'm not sure it came up on there. One thing I would point your attention to is that there is this little thing called optical EC. So just the same way that the ethylometer is reading that laser um, voltage uh, as it's collecting data, this monitor is doing the same thing as it's collecting that filter sample. And so what Forrest has been looking at is basically comparing the optical sensor um, EC value as a kind of a standard, right? We can compare this for every different method because it's just about the sample collection. It's not about the thermal method um, to the thermal optical EC um, for, for these three different methods. And so interesting what he sees is that these two methods, which again are for more ambient monitoring, um, and they have uh, sort of a slower ramp on the beginning in terms of temperature. Um, what we see is that um, he gets, you know, a bit more um, consolidated data, it's not not as variable um, as what we get with the NIOSH 5040, which kind of follows two different trends. And so his job uh, before he defends his thesis is to tell us why that's happening. Um, and so, um, but that's that's kind of interesting. I know that Sunset is real interested in this um, and, and we think it would help, you know, if, if people wanted to employ this in a mind to know which, which um, program would be best for them to use. So just some concluding remarks, um, diesel particulate monitoring, um, a continuous monitor really may serve a variety of engineering applications. Um, and at least two instruments are, are commercially available off the shelf that people could buy um, and use in this application. And, and so we've been testing both of those things for a couple of years now. Um, and we've got a VOD demonstration currently underway, um, which we hope is gonna inform industry about um, things that they've got planned and how they might be able to incorporate diesel particulate monitoring into that. So with that, I would thank you for your attention on behalf of Forrest and um, take any questions that you have.